Good afternoon, everyone. President Shapiro, Professor Henry Louis Gates, Provost Linzer, Mayor Lorraine Morton, Mrs. Marianne Forrest, Associate Deans, distinguished faculty, students, and guests, good afternoon. I'm Monica Russell Rodriguez, Associate Dean in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. On behalf of Dean Sarah Mengelsdorf, who unfortunately is ill today, I welcome you to the 2011 Leon Forrest Lectureship. The Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences established the Leon Forrest Lectureship in 1999 in tribute to his excellent scholarship, his dedication to his students, and his literary success. Through this lectureship, the African American Studies Department invites noted artists and academics to campus to celebrate the memory of Leon Forrest and explore the, Ameri the African American literature and culture. Past Leon Forrest lectures have included Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison, actor Danny Glover, and most recently authors Jamaica Kincaid and Danzy Senna. Professor Leon Forrest was not only a beloved professor at Northwestern for 24 years, he was also among the most innovative and ambitious African-American fiction writers of the 20th century. His books fused classical mythology, realism, and African-American history and culture. Professor Forrest's legacy endures through his short stories and novels, the students he taught, and of course, through events like this, which honor him. We are so pleased to have Professor Henry Louis Gates with us today to discuss his work. At this time, I present Professor Darlene Clark Hine, Northwestern's leading historian of the African American experience and chair of the African American Studies Department. Darlene. Thank you. It is indeed an honor to welcome each and every member of the greater Northwestern University community to this event. Without question, the Leon Forrest Lectureship has been one of the most outstanding series of lectures sponsored by the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. Dean Sarah Mangelstorff wanted very much to be here. And so I just think it's appropriate to thank her in her absence, sudden illness, but she's okay, <laughs> for her years of support of African American studies and of the Leon Forrest lecture. It is indeed a pleasure to stand on this stage to introduce a friend, a fabulous scholar, a leader who will introduce Skip Gates. You're probably saying, I thought you were just introducing Skip Gates. <laughs> well, each year we select someone special to officiate at this occasion, a member from the Department of African American Studies. And it just so happens that this year, the most wonderful colleague one could imagine is also the Associate Vice, the Associate Provost and the Dean of the Graduate School and a professor who has an endowed chair, the Daniel Hell Williams Professorship. He has written a number of books. He's a visionary leader and administrator. And he, along with Martha Biondi and Mary Patillo and Celeste Watkin Hayes, and Alden Morris is responsible for my being here. He was also, five years ago, the person who introduced on this platform Toni Morrison. So I think the stars are in alignment, the universe is in order, that Dwight McBride 
comes back to Northwestern University just in time to introduce to us the speaker for this evening, the fabulous, wonderful, inspiring, I know you think I'm going to say Henry Louis Gates, <laughs> Dwight McBride. <laughs> Good afternoon. One more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is your warm up act, Skip. So, yeah, get them warm for you. Um, it is really my pleasure to be here this afternoon to introduce um, our distinguished guest today. I want to thank also uh, Dean's Mangl Dean Mangelsdorf, um, Estelle Yuri, the special events coordinator from Weinberg, uh, Suzette Dunos, and Marjorie McDonald, um, who staffed the Department of African American Studies so superbly and also um, Darlene clark Hine for her superb and inspiring leadership of our department. Today, <clears throat> in the form of both this annual lecture and an endowed professorship in the Department of African American Studies, which was first held by our colleague and friend, Dr. Sandra Richards, and is currently held by our colleague and friend, Dr. Alden Morris, we honor the memory and service of our late colleague, Professor Leon Forrest. Though I never had the opportunity are the privilege to meet Leon. His reputation as a gentleman and a scholar and his unparalleled works of fiction are known far and wide. They stretched even to me in my undergraduate days at Princeton University where I was first introduced to Leon Forrest's work by one of my mentors who not only was a past Leon Forrest lecturer here but also another of America's great literary treasures and also Leon Forrest's editor at Random House, the incomparable Toni Morrison. It was also in those same days at Princeton that I was introduced both to the scholarship and the person of today's honored guest, Dr. Henry Lewis, AKA Skip Gates, Jr. It was the late 80s, perhaps even 1990, when Skip visited Princeton. At the time, Ruth Simmons, who's the current president of Brown University, was associate dean of the faculty, and Princeton was in the process of building its own distinguished African-American studies faculty. Skip was brought to campus for a recruitment visit. As part of that visit, which Skip may scarcely remember today, they wanted him to meet with students in the English department. And since there were no black graduate students at Princeton at the time, a fact uh, in the English department, a fact that we would, of course, rue in any of our departments at Northwestern, right? uh, Elaine Showalter, <clears throat> then chair of the English department, asked Kim Slaughter and me to meet with Professor Gates, as we were two African-American undergraduates in the department on the Student Advisory Council who were known to be headed to graduate school in English. Meeting one uh, who even then was already a leading figure in African-American literary and cultural studies, to say the least, was quite thrilling for two young and aspiring scholars. One of the first things that I noted about Skip in, that, Skip in person uh, which is the same as in his scholarship, is that he's a big thinker. He gravitates toward big problems and big ideas. The next occasion that I would have to meet Skip, the tables would be somewhat turned. He was meeting with me and Daphne Brooks, a colleague now on the faculty at Princeton, to recruit us as prospective graduate students to the Harvard English Department. We first met with Skip at the Du Bois Institute and after walked with him to Massachusetts Hall where he was going into a meeting with the president. He extolled the virtues of Harvard, the resources that we'd have at our disposal, and the opportunities to participate in some exciting and very large scale research projects. But what I recall most from that encounter occurred on the steps of Massachusetts Hall just before we parted. Skip raised his cane and pointed out over Harvard Yard and said to us, look at this, look at this. If you don't come here, this will never change. And with that, he was off. <laughs> this is one of the times when Skip was wrong. <laughs> Neither Daphne or I attended Harvard. We both went to UCLA. But Skip and his colleagues in the African American Studies Department that he would chair and build over the next several years at Harvard where he had the profound, a profound, would have a profound impact on that institution. 
And today, it is one of the most diversified elite private institutions in the nation. So the place did indeed decidedly change because of, in part, their hard work and commitment. And that's, the huge, that's a huge part of the kind of impact and institutional investment that doesn't appear on one's vita, but that has been very much made by our guest today in practically every institution where he's been on the faculty. And as a colleague in that struggle, as well as in the field of African American studies today, I applaud him in that great work. Skip needs little introduction. A giant in academia, a well-known public intellectual, not adverse to controversy. <laughs> Professor Gates earned his MA and PhD in English literature from Clare College at the University of Cambridge. He received a BA summa cum laude in English literature, uh, in English language and literature from Yale University. Before joining the faculty of Harvard in 1991, he taught at Yale, Cornell, and Duke universities. He's the author of numerous works of literary criticism, including Figures in Black, Words, Signs, and the, ra radical, and the, ra and the Racial Self, 1987, The Signifying Monkey, A Theory of Afro-American Literary Criticism, which won the 1989 American Book Award, and Luce Cannon's Notes on the Culture Wars from 1992. He also co-authored Colored People, a memoir, 1994, which traces his childhood experience in a small West Virginia town in the 1950s and 60s. In 1996, he co-authored The Future of the Race with Cornell West and has published a collection of his essays from The New Yorker, 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Man. Professor Gates has also edited several anthologies, including the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, and the Oxford Schomburg Liter uh, Library of 19th Century Black Women Writers in 1991. He's also the co-publisher of Transition Magazine. In addition <clears throat> to over 40 honorary degrees, Professor Gates has been the recipient of num numerous honors and grants, including the MacArthur Foundation's uh, AKA Genius Grant in 1981, the George Polk Award for Social Commentary in 1993, the Chicago Tribune Heartland Award in 1994, the Golden Plate Achievement Award in 1995, Time Magazine's 25 Most Influential Americans list in 1997, a National Humanities Medal, and election to the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1999. At Harvard, Gates is the Alphonse Fletcher University Professor and Director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African American Research. He's perhaps best known to the general public for his African American Live series broadcast on PBS in 2000, 2007, and 2008. In addition to tracing his own roots, he traced the ancestry of Oprah Winfrey, Morgan Freeman, Maya Angelou, Whoopi Goldberg, and other prominent African Americans using genealogy, oral history, family stories, and DNA analysis. Drawing from his recent publicly accessible work, Professor Gates's lecture today is entitled African American Lives, Genealogy, Genetics, and African American History. Please join me in welcoming our very distinguished guest, our friend, and our colleague, the 2011 Leon Forrest Lecturer, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. That's a great introduction, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dwight, my God, what a great introduction. I didn't want you to stop. I wondered who he was talking about. Let me put this picture back. Now, I remember Dwight. I begged that boy to come to Harvard. He said, not enough sunshine. So he went west. Dwight's the best of, uh, the, the, brings together the best of, uh, the best of the best administrators, an intellectual, a great scholar who loves to, um, to run things, to administer things, to make things happen for other people. And we need that. We don't have enough great administrators of any gender or um, ethnic um, group. And God knows we don't have enough black great administrators. Give it up for Dwight McBride. I'm proud of you. Nor do we have enough great presidents. Um, you have a new president, and I want to tell you how I met him. 
Now, you are so lucky to have this man as president. He is, he is a fantastic guy. But I met him. At the, you had just been selected as president, right? And um, so I was at O'Hare getting on a United flight flying back to Boston. And this man came up to me and he said he was the new president of Northwestern and I pointed out that I hadn't been invited to speak here in many years, you know, and I, <laughs> as soon as he got settled, might be a nice thing to invite me. I told him who my lecture agent was, you know, everything would be cool. <laughs> so we were, it turned out we were on the same flight. So I said, great, well maybe we could sit together. He had his family's beautiful wife and his children. And um, he said, well, I think it'll be a problem. I said, why, you don't want to sit next to me? He goes, well, I'm in coach class. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> so I had him from first class send the man a drink back there, you know, like some. <laughs> now, you got to let me do your contract. You're not supposed to be in the back of the pl You know, they freed our people. We don't have to sit in the back anymore. <laughs> But he's a great guy and a great, give it up for the president, President Schmidt. And my heart, this is the only reason I came here, didn't have anything to do with the president, certainly didn't have anything to do with the provost. It had to do with this woman I've been in love with so long, just in every way possible. Um, I love Darlene. Darlene is just, from the beginning, you ever have somebody you meet and you just have a connection? You know, you trust them. It's like a soulmate. It's like a long lost friend. The first time we ever met so many, so many years ago. And she's a great historian, a great scholar. She gave a dazzling set of the Huggins Lectures, Harvard's greatest lectures uh, in African and African American history. And I'm hoping she'll spend her sabbatical at the Du Bois Institute and turn those lectures uh, into a book. Her work on, uh, multi-volume work on uh, black women in American history inspired me to think about biography in a new way, and that led to our, um, the great project that Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham and I did, eight volumes of black biographies uh, called the African American National Bi Biography, and we had lunch. I never eat before a lecture. You know, I like to go do my email, you know, get it together. Um, but my secretary said, you know, Darlene, the Professor Clark Hyde wants to be, I said, okay, that's fine. And she gave me two things. One was this collection that she did as a result of her fantastic conference here on uh, black people in Europe. And then, and she wrote just such a nice thing um, in it. And then she gave me the only copy of a new journal that she invented, she conceived and executed. And it's the subtitle, it's called The Journal for Research on African American Women. And it's named Phyllis, P-H-I-L-L-I-S. And you all know who that Phyllis is the first person of African descent to publish a book of poetry in the English language in all of history was Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley, who came here at the age of seven, came to Boston, arrived in Boston Harbor on a ship called the Phyllis. And that's how she got her name. And her master and mister, mistress, John and Susanna Wheatley, were petty merchants. He was a tailor in Boston. They needed a house servant, and they got her for a song. She was the last slave purchased on, from that boat in Boston Harbor. In 1761, and four years later, she um, wrote her first poem in English. And by 1770, she was a celebrity. She was the Toni Morrison of the 18th century. And September 5th, 1773, she published the first book of poetry by a black person. Nobody in Boston believed that she had written the poems herself because they said Africans weren't smart enough to write poetry. So they had to send her to London with a certificate of attestation signed by eight, the 18 most respectable characters in Boston, include, that's how they defend, identify themselves, including John Hancock, the John Hancock, and the governor of the colony of Massachusetts and um, the lieutenant governor. They gave her an oral exam to see if she'd really written her poems. And even then, the Boston printers wouldn't publish the book, so they sent her to London that summer. Benjamin Franklin came from France just to meet her, to see an African who had written a book of poetry. And Voltaire wrote a letter to his friend in 1774 saying, you see, Africans are equal because Phyllis Wheatley has published a book of poetry. It's only the rarest scholar, the most sensitive scholar, who picking, starting a journal dedicated to research on African-American women who would be smart enough and sensitive enough to go back to the origin, and that is your own 
Darlene Clark Hine. Give it up for a wise, wise help. I'll see y'all later, lecture over. <laughs> Finally, um, <laughs> Leon Forrest, Dwight, you, I'm, I was shocked I'm, that just to think that Leon was gone, you know, I just turned 60, man, so you know, you get all the chronology mixed up. I love Leon F Forrest. I'm from West Virginia, as Dwight said. His wife is from West Virginia. And, you know, we were always thinking about who were the legitimate heirs to Ralph Ellison. And this is before Toni Morrison even, you know, emerged as, as Toni Morrison. I knew Toni Morrison first when she was an editor at Random House. We hired her to teach Afro black women and their fiction at Yale when I was just a, a kid. And um, the two candidates were Leon Forrest and James Allen McPherson. And There is a Tree More Ancient Than Eden is a book that everybody should, should read. Leon used to be the editor of Muhammad Speaks. And then... But he was not a Muslim himself, but he was an editor. He loved editing. And then he wrote this novel, which Ellison introduced and got fantastic reviews. It was a work of genius. And when I was in my 20s, uh, just finishing my PhD at the University of Cambridge, I was at an MLA, Modern Language Association, meeting. That, for those of you students who don't know, that's when all the teachers of English um, at the college, university level, college, high school, get together, big 10,000 people, and they take over some large hotels in cities. And there was Leon Forrest, and I went up to him, I said, Mr. Forrest, you know, it's just an honor to meet you. And another friend who had gone to Harvard, Joel Motley, had written a review of his novel. And he said, well, I'm gonna take you guys for a drink. I couldn't believe it. And we talked, we were there for about two hours. <clears throat> and I was deciding whether to finish my PhD or to go to law school. Why do I want to go to law school? Because I wanted to be rich. <laughs> And because I doubted that I had the ability to finish a PhD dissertation that would be approved at the University of Cambridge. This is a true story. So I figured, you know, I applied to Harvard and Yale Law School and I got in. And I was telling him this and he looked at me, I'll never forget it, and this has haunted me to this day. He said, Brother Gates, I've only known you a little bit. He said, but many are called, few are chosen to be a scholar and to be a scholar of your people, and you can have the goods. And I got tears in my eyes, Dwight, when he told me that. He didn't even know me, man. And so as I left Wall Street and thought about the millions of dollars I'd be losing, <laughs> I went back um, to New Haven, and I pledged myself to the life of the mind. So it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure and deep, deep honor to be the fifth, I suppose, in this great lecture series honoring um, one of my heroes, Leon Forrest, so maybe he's listening, but please give it up to one of the truly great novelists in the African-American tradition. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna put my watch up here so I don't talk all day. And uh, I wanna tell you, how's a guy with a um, PhD in English language and literature end up um, doing TV series on, and writing books about uh, genealogy and genetics? Well, it all, started on the day I met this lady. Now, this is my great-great-grandmother. Her name was Jane Gates, and she was a slave. Now, obviously, as you can see from her uh, dates, that she was born in 1819, and she died in 1888. So obviously, I didn't meet her in the flesh. But I want to tell you the first time I saw this image. It was July 3rd, 1960, and it was at my grandfather's funeral. Um, now, I was standing in front of my grandfather's casket. I was nine years old, and I was holding my father's hand. My father uh, just died on Christmas Eve, so, you know, if I, I think I can get through this, but my father was a great man, and um, he was 97 and a half. He'd be hitting on Darlene <laughs> if he was here. And my, but my father was a funny man. My father was the funniest man I have ever met. My father made Red Fox look like an undertaker. <laughs> I want to tell you how funny my father was, because it's part of this story. I, when I was growing up, Dwight, in the 50s and, and 60s, the blackest thing you could be, ladies and gentlemen, was a doctor or a lawyer, not a basketball player or an entertainer. We respected basketball players and entertainers, but 
the, the people were on the cover of the Crisis magazine with black doctors and lawyers and the scientists. That's the way it was. But we had values, and we understood the value of an education, which goes back to slavery for our people. Too many of our people have lost their way, but that's another lecture at another time. And um, so I wanted to go to Harvard or Yale, and I wanted to go to Oxford or Cambridge. When my cousins wanted to be Hank Aaron and Willie Mays, I wanted to go to Harvard or Yale. Because from TV, I could see smart people went to Harvard or Yale. My mama said I was smart. My mama could tell me I could fly, and I would have jumped off that balcony, you know, because I believed my mother. So I, um, I've, had, I've always been blessed in the classroom, as our people say. And uh, I went to Yale, and I did very well. And so um, I was about, I, I'm, uh, as I began my senior year, I decided that I was going to go for it. I was going to go to Oxford or Cambridge, or at least try to. So I applied for every fellowship that would take me to Oxford or Cambridge, or Oxbridge, as we say. I applied for Rhodes, and I applied for Marshall, and a Fulbright, everything. Now look, I was junior year Phi Beta Kappa. I was something called the Scholar of the House. He only picked 12 of those. I was going to graduate summa cum laude, and I was black from West Virginia, from Appalachia. I mean, damn, how are they not going to pick me, Dwight, right? <laughs> So I must have been cocky or arrogant. I want all the students to hear this story. Because I walked in like I was bad. And I knew they were going to send me to England. And so I applied for seven fellowships. I lost the first six. I lost the first six fellowships. And it blew my mind. I hadn't applied for any graduate school, anything. Because I knew I was going to go to England. So I was down to my last fellowship. And I was dating Linda Darling. Now, you all know her. She's a great scholar at Stanford, Linda Darling Hammond, one of the geniuses in the field of education. We were junior year item at Yale, right? And um, we were going to be the new Negro couple. You know, she had a big Angela Davis afro. <laughs> I had an afro. You know my man, Cornell West, who's given this lecture. Cornell West afro looked like a crew cut next to my afro. <laughs> I looked like a black cotton candy walking down the street. <laughs> had my afro pick. Great thing about afro pick, you can scratch your head and get your hair out at the same time. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. People go, wow. <laughs> so I went to Linda. I said, what am I doing wrong? She said, Skippy, you're being artificial. You're being phony. Go in there and be yourself. So I went in there. I was my so, And I got this fellowship. Other than the, I have two daughters. Other than the days that those girls were born, happiest day of my life, really. So I ran back to Calhoun College at Yale, and I called Piedmont, West Virginia, and my daddy answered the phone. <laughs> And in those days, we didn't have two phones. You had a phone and an extension phone. Remember that? So I said, Daddy, Daddy, put Mama on the extension phone. She was upstairs in our house. And Mama got on the phone. I said, Mama, Daddy, you'll never believe it. Never I got a Mellon Fellowship. I got a Mellon Fellowship. I'm the first Afro-American. Remember, this is February 1973. We were Afro-Americans then. <laughs> I, got, I am the first Afro-American to get a Mellon Fellowship without missing a beat. My daddy said, you're the first Negro to get a Mellon Fellowship? I said, yeah, Daddy. He said, huh, they're going to call it the Watermelon Fellowship for me. <laughs> So arm of my watermelon fellowship, I went off to the University of Cambridge. <laughs> now I'm telling you a story because as funny as he was um, when I was 22, he was that funny when I was nine. And remember, I'm holding his hand, standing in front of his father's casket at the Kite Funeral Home in Cumberland, Maryland. All the colored people, as we would have said then, in Cumberland, Maryland were there because my grandfather was a very prominent man in, in the black community. And I was holding his hand, and I looked. I'd never been this close to a corpse. I could see it just like it's here. And I looked at him, and he looked ridiculous. My grandfather was so white when he had blood coursing through his veins that the kids, the grandchildren, called him Casper behind his back. <laughs> this is Jane Gates' son, my great-grandfather, Edward Gates. And as you can see, he looks like a white man. That is my grandfather. So I now, if he looks this white, when he has blood coursing through his veins, imagine how white he looked dead, right? I, it looked like he had been coated with alabaster and sprinkled with baby powder, right? <laughs> so I thought, I heard this noise from my father, and I thought my father was laughing at how ridiculous his grandfather looked. I mean, his father looked. So I started to laugh, too, and I looked up, and my father, big tears were running down his face. He started to howl. I'd never seen my father cry. So I started to cry, too, first because I was so shocked to see my daddy cry, and secondly, because I had laughed and I embarrassed myself and my family in front of all the colored people in Carmel, Maryland. Fortunately, I was just a little kid. Everybody in town was so shocked to see Daddy cry because he was so funny that nobody noticed me. But I was traumatized by this. And we went off and buried um, 
Pop Gates, that's Edward St. Lawrence Gates, as you can see, born 1879, died in 1960. We went off and buried him, and we came back to the Gates family home. The Gates family home with this woman, who was a slave till 1865, bought in cash in 1870 in an all-white neighborhood in Cumberland, Maryland. Cumberland, Maryland is halfway between Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C., in the Allegheny Mountains on the Potomac River, predominantly white town. She paid cash to integrate in 1870. Now, she didn't get $1,200 in cash by saving up her pennies in slavery, right? She was a midwife, as you can see. This is her midwifery outfit. And uh, that's her, you know, her nurse. She delivered babies. And <clears throat> so we'll figure out where she got that money a little bit later. So Daddy took us back to the house that this woman had bought in 1870, which we still own. And he took us up to my grandparents' bedroom. My brother, me. My brother's Dr. Paul Gates. He's chief of uh, dentistry at Bronx Lebanon Hospital. He's old than I am, five years old. I don't know about you all, but we didn't even know that our grandparents had a bedroom. They would just disappear at night up the steps. We weren't allowed to go upstairs in our grandparents' bedroom. You know, things were formal then. You know, you didn't sit on somebody's bed. You didn't go to, you know, an older person's bedroom. You didn't walk on a grave. Remember those days? That was the good old days. We had values. I liked it. My father used to say about my brother, but he said we were raised like weeds. <laughs> we had no values at all. And I, unfortunately, I think it's only gotten worse. So my daddy, it takes me and my brother without any prelude up to my grandparents' bedroom. We're in shock. So we're in shock. So we go back to my grandparents' bedroom. It's still there. You go in, and there's a sun porch. And he took us out on the sun porch. It's like we were going to the moon. Rocky, Rocky and I were looking around. Wow, they got a bedroom. <laughs> Actually sleep in a bed. So he, he takes us out, and there was this big wardrobe, like a cabinet. And Daddy opened it, and it was full of bank ledgers. My grandfather used to clean the First National Bank of Cumberland, Maryland, on Baltimore Street. That was one of his businesses, janitorial business. And he was stealing these bank ledgers. Now, Rocky and I looked at each other. We thought we must be rich. Like, they, were, like they, that was a family fortune. They would tell us we inherited a million dollars or something. But Daddy started pulling these bank ledgers off and opening them. And they weren't bank ledgers. They were scrapbooks. He was stealing these bank ledgers and clipping newspapers. He loved newspapers, newspaper junkie. And he had a mordant fascination with death. Every, even as, as Daddy turned the pages, we could see automobile accidents, railroad accidents, airplane accidents. The daily war dead in World War II. Every day, headline would be, how many people died during World War II? Whatever, wherever you were in the United States, he clipped these every day. But he also was a race man, even though he looked like a white man. To my amazement, I had no idea. But he had the first Negro selected as a judge in 1942 in New York City. You know, there it was, that article. Adam Clayton Powell, articles about him. So it was great. So Rocky and I were just freaked out. We were wondering what daddy's looking for. And finally, he finds what he's looking for. He said, you boys look at this. And we looked down, and it was an obituary. And it was dated January 6, 1888. And it said, died this day in Cumberland, Maryland, Jane Gates, an estimable colored woman. An estimable colored woman. And Daddy said, that's the oldest Gates that we can trace. And I never want you to forget her. And then he pulled this picture out between the leaves of that, um, the, the bank ledger. And he said, this is she. And she was a slave. And he said, a white man fathered her children. And we don't know who that white man was. And he said, I never want you to forget that. Then he shut the book, put the picture back in, shut the book put it back on the shelf, and we went downstairs, ate like you do after a black funeral, and went back home. The last thing I did, we, my dad worked two jobs. He worked the paper mill in the daytime. He was a janitor in the evening. So we were always, we were, well, frankly, you know, there was a handful of black people. We were the richest black family. You know, everything is relative. I didn't know I was poor until I went to Yale <laughs> a few years later. But we always had, my brother and I always had our own bedroom. I always had a, my own desk. I always had my own bookcase. And I had a red Webster's Dictionary right on my desk. And the last thing I did, Mr. President, before I went to sleep that night, was look up the word estimable, because I didn't know what it meant. And I thought, wow, she must have been a special person because she was estimable in 1888. The next day was the 4th of July, 1960. And we went to the colored cookout because our town was strictly segregated. Irish, Italian, paper mill town, a handful of black people. And on the way back, I stopped at Red Bull's newsstand. He was Irish, of Irish descent. 
and I bought a composition book. And that night, I sat in front of our family TV, and I interviewed my mother and father about their family tree. I was nine years old. I had no inclination before, the, the day before. I never even thought about a family tree. But somehow, seeing her picture and reading that obituary ch changed my life. And so I interviewed my parents that night about who their parents were and their grandparents and their great-grandparents as far back as they could go. Now, and I've kept up this fascination with genealogy all my life and until today. Now, I was just a kid, so sometimes I would lose the composition book, I would lose interest. I would start all over. A few years later, I would interview them all over again. But I wanted to know my roots. I wanted to know where I came from. I look like my mother, my mother's color. I wanted to know why my mother's family looked the way they did and why my father's family looked white and had good hair, as we used to say in aquiline features. And somehow I thought maybe I could get at that through, through my family tree and my DNA. Well, 1977, 1976, this book appears, 1977, was the greatest thing happening in the world. It's the ABC miniseries called Roots. You could, and like everybody else in America, I watch Roots, I was riveted every night. And you could say since 1977, I've had a serious case of Roots envy. I wanted to be like Alex Haley. I wanted to go back to the slave ship and find my people. My, I wanted to have my Kunta Kinte moment. And I wanted to be able to go back and find the tribe, the ethnic group that my family was descended from. But only Alex Haley did that. Now, truth be told, as Professor Clark Hine would tell you, many scholars, many historians, question whether Alex Haley actually did find the um, ethnic group that he was from. But I got to know Alex Haley through Quincy Jones, and um, he was a friend of mine. I'm often asked, I mean, there are people who tried to get Alex Haley's Pulitzer Prize taken away. Uh, you know, really nasty things. And so whenever I'm asked, I say, Alex Haley was a friend of mine. He went to his grave believing that he, Kunta Kinte was his ancestor. He came from Gambia. That's good enough for me. Because what do I know? I'd have to replicate a scholarship in order to find out. But I would always dream, just think if it were possible, just think if it were possible to reverse the Middle Passage metaphorically and find where our ancestor came from Africa. Wouldn't that be fantastic? But of course, you know, that's impossible, right? Well, the year 2000, I'm sitting at Harvard minding my own business. I get a phone call. And it's from a black man named Dr. Rick Kittles, brilliant geneticist at Howard University. And he called me. He's now at the University of Chicago Medical School. And Rick said that he had pioneered this new technique through your DNA, your mitochondrial DNA, at the time that's what they were using, that's the DNA you would inherit from your mother. Your mitochondria, you have Y DNA you get from your father if you're a man. That's, if you have Y DNA, that's what makes you a man. And we all have mitochondrial DNA that we get from our mother. It's, it's an identic genetic fingerprint, identical genetic fingerprint. It never changes. Back 10,000 years, it's identical, right? And that, ten, that fact that it replicates itself exactly is very, very important to what I'm about to say. And he said, using this technique, they could tell where we were from in Africa. And he was trying to get some uh, well-known black men to volunteer to have this done for free. But he couldn't get anybody to do it. I, couldn't, I thought that was strange. But I went, are you kidding me? We could do it. Roots in a test tube, roots for the 21st century. So I said, come on up. And he was so dead. He flew up the next day, flew from Howard, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., up to Harvard. And he came to my house right in the middle of Harvard Square. Now, Rick Kittle's of many things. He's a genius. But the one thing he's not a genius at is extracting blood. <laughs> now, if you can see, I have veins. I have many operations. I've had over a dozen operations on my hip. My blood just, you know, they get a, need, a needle and just spews out. After 45 minutes of him jabbing in my arm, I said, no wonder I'm the only black man dumb enough to submit to this. <laughs> You know, how bad do I want to meet Kunta Kinte? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you see, at the time, those of you who've had ancestral DNA done, you just spit in a test tube or swab your cheek now. But this was 11 years ago. And to get a sufficient amount of DNA, they needed a large vial of blood. And it had to be extracted. So anyway, finally he gets this big needle, I mean this big thing full of blood. And he gets in his taxi and goes back to Howard. I don't hear from him for the next six months. I call Rick over and over again. I don't hear from him. So finally, 
I got the feeling he was avoiding me. You know what I'm talking about? So I used a different phone, you know, different caller ID. <laughs> I, I, I dialed it right once. He said, hello. I said, Rick, it's me. He goes, man, I was just about to call you. <laughs> I go, Rick, where am I from? Where am I from? I want to know where I'm from. He said, man, your results were anomalous. We had to run them about 10 times. And he said, but you are the rarest, from the rarest tribe, ethnic group of all, you are a Nubian. Now, all black Americans, when you give them the test, want to be from Zululand. They want to be Zulus and want to be Nubians. Why? They want to be descended from Chaka Zulu, the great warrior, and kick the English in the behind. You know, black people fought back, beat the white man until the end, and you finally lost, right? But that whole South African thing, you know, little Mandela Association by extension. No, he wasn't Zulu, but uh, not Zulu, but you know, the whole thing. So, um, when we gave Oprah her DNA test, she went the next day to South Africa to announce the birth of the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy. This is before the thing was built. And I'm sitting at home watching CNN, and she announced that she had taken a DNA test and that she was a Zulu. So I called Rick Kittles. I said, Rick, did you tell Oprah she was a Zulu? He goes, no, what, where'd you get that? I said, I'm watching it on TV, man. She says she's a Zulu. He said, no, man. And I go, Rick, is anybody in your lab? He goes, no. I said, make her a Zulu. <laughs> I'm going to tell Oprah Winfrey she's not a Zulu? Forget it. Everybody wants to be a Zulu, like Oprah. She's not. Or, <laughs> or a Nubian. Why? Because the Nubians were the black pharaohs. You know, people argue all day long what the Egyptians look like. Newsflash, people do not change how they look in evolution in 3,000 years. 3,000 years is like a nanosecond. No, the Egyptians look like, you look at Mubarak. They look like Mubarak, all right? That's what they look like. But Mubarak got a little wave in there, you know, got that little touch of the tar brush the way you know what I'm talking about. A lot of mixture going on on the Nile. <laughs> so they clearly are mixed people. But the Nubians were black people. If the Nubians walked in here, the Egyptians are mixed people. But the Nubians were black people that are always represented in Egyptian art as darker than the Egyptians. And they were at war all the time. And the 25th dynasty, which obtained between 725 BC and 650 AD, was the Nubian dynasty in Egypt. And the two great pharaohs were Pianchi and Taharqa. You can Google Taharqa. Taharqa is in the Bible, in the Old Testament. He was a ferocious pharaoh, and he was, without a doubt, a black man. So we all want to be Nubians, or we want to be Zulus. But there's only a slight problem uh, with wanting those identities. None of our ancestors came from Nubia or came from Zululand. Nubia runs from Khartoum, the capital of the Sudan, up to the Aswan Dam, which is the second cataract. All our ancestors came from West and Central Africa, except 2% had come from Mozambique, right? That means that my putative ancestor would have had to walk across the Sahara Desert. For what? To get off boats so they can go pick cotton in Alabama? <laughs> How dumb do I look? <laughs> How dumb, therefore, would my ancestor be? Never happened, right? But hey, Rick Kittle said, he's my man. He said, I'm a Nubian. I'm a Nubian. And he said the other thing he told me on the phone, he said, all of the Afrocentrists want to be Nubian, like my friend Malefi Asante. Malefi Asante and I argue all the time in public, but really we're very close. You know, I really admire him. And it's a good thing. So you know, we can disagree in public without descending into your mama and your daddy criticism, right? <laughs> Which is very rare in the African-American tradition. <laughs> so he said, yeah, like Malefi Asante, he wanted to be Nubian. I called Malefi at home, man, so I couldn't wait to get off the phone. I said, yo, Malefi, you are talking to the Nubian prince right here. <laughs> I was the only Nubian in the whole database, 2,200 people that Dr. Rick Kittles had. And I was proud. He sent me a certificate. I hung it on the wall of my living room, Nubian prince, right there. That would be me. Well, I, my best friend, Anthony Appiah, is the great philosopher at Princeton. I remember the day my certificate came saying I was a Nubian. He looked at it. He, he is Anglo-Ghanaian. His uncle was the Asantehini, the king of the Asante people, whose symbol of authority is a gold stool, right? He looked at this. He says, what a ton of rubbish. <laughs> I said, you just jealous, man. I am the prince. I got up 
A couple weeks later, I got up in the middle of the night, I have to say, not to be indelicate, got up to go to the bathroom. And I got the greatest idea, one of the greatest ideas I ever had. That idea was that I would do the family tree, this passion I had since July 3rd, 1960. I would pick eight prominent African Americans, I'd do their family tree back to the slavery, when as Darlene knows, the paper trail ends. You can't trace somebody without paper, without their name on it. And once the paper trail ended, I would do their DNA, their mitochondrial DNA, and reveal what tribe they were from in Africa. I would do Alex Haley for the 21st century. I would do Roots in a Test Tube. And I was so excited. So the next day, I called Quincy Jones. Why Quincy? Quincy scored, Quincy scored the music for Roots. And as I said earlier, he introduced me to, to Alex Haley. And he always wanted to know where he was from in Africa, too. So Quincy's like a vampire. Quincy was a jazz musician. He's up all night. Even today, I mean, he'll be up all night. When the sun comes up, he goes to bed. So you can't call Quincy till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I waited patiently. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I called Quincy Jones. I said uh, to, to this person, I said, would you tell, ask Q, tell him I'm on the line. So he got on there. He said, Skip, what's happening? I said, Q, what if I could do for you what Alex did for himself? He said, can you do that? I go, I can do it, man. Would you be in my series? I didn't have any money. I just had an idea. I didn't know how much it cost. <laughs> he said, I'm in. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, what? He said, does it hurt? <laughs> it's true. I lied. I go, no, man, it don't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I waited a beat. I didn't want to be vulgar. Who's Quincy Jones' the best friend? The big old Oprah, right? So I had met Oprah through Quincy, but like for five seconds once in a restaurant in Miami, but I didn't know her. So I said, Q, um, would you ask Oprah? And he said, uh, no. <laughs> but he said, I'll do you one better. I'll give you her secret name and address. So he did. And I wrote her. He said, write her a letter. So I thought, wow, well, that's, a, that's just a brush up. So I sat down, typed the letter. Remember, this was a long time ago. Sent it to this, to this name. I didn't even know if it would get there, man. It was in Chicago, the Chicago address. And I didn't hear anything. About a week later, my cell phone rang. It was Sunday afternoon. It said, Quincy Jones is called. So I said, Q, what's happening? I was about to say, you know, I never heard from Oprah. And a deep woman's voice said, Dr. Gates, this is Oprah Winfrey. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> See, one thing you learn is powerful people don't call you with bad news. If it's good news, they'll be on the line. Otherwise, it'd be secretary number 29 calling you, uh, Ms. Winfrey cannot see you ever for the rest of your life. <laughs> Now, to the students, why did I need Quincy Jones and Oprah Winfrey and the other people that I'll talk about in a minute? Because it cost $6 million to do African American lives. And when I could walk in, which I subsequently did, to Coca-Cola, the first sponsor I pitched, somebody had to write the check, right? And I said, how would you like your product associated with the world knowing what tribe Oprah Winfrey's descended from in Africa? They go, can you do that? I go, I can do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, see that ceiling? It's like that ceiling opened up and a giant ATM machine slows. <laughs> they go like, <laughs> how much money do you need? <laughs> so I got, Whoopi Goldberg heard that we were doing this series. Whoopi's up in the upper left-hand corner. And she called over and over, demanded to be in the series. I love Whoopi Goldberg. Dr. Ben Carson is in the middle top. He was my classmate at Yale. We've known each other since 1969. For those of you who don't know, He's the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, the first neurosurgeon successfully to separate Siamese twins and joined at the brain. Mae Jemison, on the right, graduated from Stanford, African studies major, uh, graduated medical school, first black female astronaut. Quincy's in the middle, the big O's over there. Bishop T.D. Jakes, under Quincy, he's my man, black West Virginian, had to take care of the homeboy. I wonder, religious figure, and I was fascinated by, I mean, um, T.D. Jakes, the Potter's House, the name of his church, has 30,000 members. You know, he had something going on for him. Chris Tucker, I'd met Chris by this time. Um, it turned out to be a great guest. And right under Chris Tucker, uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, the professor of sociology and education at Harvard, because I didn't want the guests just to be entertainers. So I did the Fabulous Tree, did the DNA. It was a whole experiment. We got the money. And the result was the biggest audience in the history of any black documentary in PBS. And it was. Um, so successful that the, I did a second series, um, and it was so successful that um, 
a woman, happened to be a Jewish woman of Russian descent, wrote to me and said, what well, are you, some kind of racist you don't like? How come you only do black people? You're supposed to be Mystery Multiculturalism. And so I went, wow, you know, I wonder if I could change the brand. You know, because it's where I live. I live in Africa and African America. And I thought, well, why not? Why not try? And um, so I decided, Dwight, what could my approach be? And I decided to use what I call the Noah's Ark approach to Muslims, to Jews, to Roman Catholics, to West Indians, because many West Indians have written me and say, how come you only do black Americans don't do in West Indies? And um, so we did Meryl Streep and Mike Nichols and um, um, Malcolm Gladwell and Elizabeth Alexander, and the result was Face of America. I want to, Dwight tell me I'm running out of time. I want to um, just run through a few of the, the amazing things that I've learned doing, doing these series. Um, we have counted scholars under the direction of David Eltis have counted the number of slaves that you can, using shipping records because it was capitalism. And so we now know that there were 12.5 million Africans who boarded ships between 1502 and 1866. 15% or so die in the Middle Passage. That means 11.2 million get off the ships in the New World. And of that 11.2 million, you know how many arrived in the United States? 388,000 directly. Another 60,000 touched down briefly in the Caribbean and then came to the United States. 450,000 Africans, that's all that came to the United States in the entire history of the slave trade. So the 40 million of us African Americans, unless you're descended from a recent immigrant, are all descended from those, the originals, 450,000. All the rest went to places south of Miami. 4.8 million landed in Brazil alone. So the real black experience, south of our national border. Incredible. If I did the DNA of all the black people in this room, we can now say 23.6% of you, like Alex believe, came from ethnic groups from Senegal and Gambia. 11.6% from Sierra Leone. I'm being anachronistic because, of course, these countries didn't exist, qua countries, except for Sierra Leone. Um, and and uh, Liberia after 1791 and after 1821. Um, well, 1806 and, and 1821. 11.6 came from Ghana. 16.7% came from Eastern Nigeria, predominantly Igbo. So if I did the DNA of every black person in this room on your mother's side, 16% of you, 16 out of 100, will be, have identical uh, mitochondrial DNA with an Igbo person walking around. 2.4% Yoruba from Western Nigeria and Benin. Here's a shocker, 24% from ethnic groups from Angola. One in four of you descend from an ethnic group at Angola and 2% from Mozambique all the way around on the other side. Um, the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, you could Google all this information, it's a big public database, looked at over 35,000 voyages of slave ships to compile those records. Um, how American are the African-American people. Well, by the time Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776, 75% of our ancestors, so those 450,000, were here. So that means we've been American for a very long time. By 1800, 80% of our ancestors were here, and by 1820, 99.7% of our ancestors were here. Here's a shocking statistic that bears on my family. If you look at the federal census of 1860, there were 4.4 million African Americans, 3.9 million were slaves, 488,000 were free colored or free Negroes. Now here's the shock. Of that free Negro population, 225,000 lived in states, in the free states, 261,000 lived in slave states, states where slavery was legal. More free Negroes lived in the slave states in 1860 than lived in the free states. And you know you read Frederick Douglass students, and as Ismail Reed jokes, the slave was the first to read and the right was the first to run away. It's not the way it was. Why? Like in my family, all the branches of my family, as we'll see in a minute, were free except for Jane Gates by 1830, 1823. And they were all from Virginia. They all, incredibly, I only found this out because the Mormons who do my genealogy for the series did, did mine. All my family on every branch, 250 years, has lived in a 30 mile radius of the hospital where I was born, back over two hundred years. It's incredible. And when they were freed under Virginia law, the, your master had to give you 
uh, property if you were allowed to remain in the state. So what are you going to do? Leave your property and your friends and go to New York what, and be homeless? <laughs> you know. And apparently, for all that we know historically, it couldn't have been that bad. I mean, it had to be terrible, but not terrible enough for them to leave their property and go. These are people who, they're still there if you look at the 1870 census. They didn't flee even during the Civil War. It's remarkable, and not enough scholars have written about it to explain it. Um, well, here's how our DNA segment works. And Dwight, I'm going to do 10 more minutes. Is that all right? Because I wait, I told too many lies about you to warm the crowd up. <laughs> this is how the DNA component works. We give everyone three tests. Well, we give the men three tests and the women two tests. And if the woman has a brother or a direct male descendant, we give them three tests. The Y DNA, which, as I said, you get from your father or the paternal line. Mitochondrial DNA, you get from your mother's line. And the admixture test, which we call a pie chart. And the admixture tests reveal your percentage of African ancestry, European ancestry, and Asian or Native American ancestry. And here's how it works. At the sixth generation, you have 64 fourth grade grandparents. Great, 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 great grandparents. We'll start at the bottom. There's you at the bottom, then you have two parents, you have four grandparents, you have eight great grandparents, 16 great, great, and then great, 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 great. You have 64 discrete ancestors. And here's how genetic markers are passed down. The Y DNA is passed down from father to son, from Edward Gates, that man you saw, my Edward St. Lawrence Gates, his son, Henry Louis Gates Sr. and Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Paul Edward Gates have identical Y DNA. Your uh, mitochondrial DNA passed down identically from your mother, Pauline Coleman Gates and I, Marguerite Coleman, uh, Marguerite Howard Coleman, Pauline Coleman Gates and Henry Louis Gates Jr. have identical mitochondrial DNA. If you have a child, all you women have given your mitochondrial DNA to your, your child, whether it's a male or female. If you're a man, too bad, your mitochondrial DNA just disappears. How do we match people with their um, ancestors, their genetic ancestors? Well, in the case of African Americans, scientists test Africans up and down the coast. And they put their mitochondrial DNA and their Y DNA basically in a big computer. And then if we test Dwight and you have identical mitochondrial DNA to a person um, who says they're an Igbo, that means if the person's not lying, then you're descended from an Igbo person. It's as simple as that because the markers don't change. Isn't that incredible? The same with the Y DNA. Now, there are three myths doing this. Um, the biggest surprise for me was, as I said, when I went in to pitch, that woman back there in that red sweater laughing because you know what one of them's coming up. When I went in to pitch, remember when I went in to pitch the Coca-Cola to get the money to do the series, I pitched it around the DNA component because that's like magic to me. But nobody, in all, now I've done 30 people, nobody cries when I tell them you're descended, you know, 2,000 years ago from somebody who, or, you know, 500 years ago or 300 years ago from somebody who's Yoruba. They cry when we reveal their family tree, their slave ancestors. That's when they break down. Um, so it's the genealogy part that is sort of the, that drives this engine. Now here's what's, what's curious. Doing these series, I've produced, but the, when the genealogists do, you know, white people, they, excuse me, they have three myths. So I did my own three myths. The first one is that I'm descended from an Igbo princess. Now, I was sitting on um, Martha's Vineyard two summers ago when I was making Face of America, and I was at dinner. A prominent African American and his wife had me at dinner. Six, uh, four couples. I'm not going to say who they were. And I turned to the wife and I said, because I'm Mr. Genealogy, right? So I said, hey, how far can you trace your ancestors back to Africa and slavery? Slavery in Africa. And she said, well, what makes you think that we're all descended from slaves? I went like, whoa, this is going to be good. <laughs> so I kept a straight face, and I said, well, because she was angry, you know. So I said, oh, well, tell me, what do you know about your ancestors? She said, well, I'm descended from an Igbo princess who never was a slave. And I said, oh, pray tell. So tell me how this happened. She said, well, the slave ship comes to Charleston, South Carolina. And the last slave to get off the boat was this beautiful, she was fine, Igbo princess. And there was a German baron walking by. And he looked over there and said, my, look at that fine Evo princess. <laughs> and he fell in love with her on, on the spot. And he walked over 
and he told the ship cap he was going to buy her because he did not want her dainty foot ever to touch the foul soil of slavery. And he bought her and took her to the north. They got married and lived happily ever after. I went like, whoa. I thought she was going to bust out laughing, but she was serious, right? So I said, <laughs> so I said, wow, you have the most unusual family tree of any African American. I said, that's great. I went like, excuse me. I went to the bathroom and went, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can't get up because people get pissed off. You start talking about their mama and their daddy. <laughs> so I said, that's great. So I just thought that was an aberration, right? And I thought, I'm going to have our genealogy or family tree to let her know in a nice way that this has never happened. The next day, you know the great Malcolm Gladwell writes for the New Yorker bestseller. He was in Faces of America. He's a friend of mine. So <clears throat> Malcolm and we were just filming, we doing the research, the family trees for the people who got in Faces of America. So the very next day, I called Malcolm and I said, Malcolm, we always start by doing your oral history. What do you know about, what stories do you know about your family? Then we have them fill out a form, they name their mother and father, grandparents, when and where they were born, et cetera, right? He said, oh man, well, you know, I'm Jamaican, that's why I picked him, because his mother's a Jamaican, his father's a white Englishman, and they grew up in Canada. And he said, yeah, we, and we know a lot about our family in Jamaica. I go, yeah, he said, in fact, they're Igbo. In fact, I'm descended from an Igbo princess. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, man, there was this German baron, and he was walking along this ship. <laughs> I swear to God, I went like, wow. OK, that's the first myth. None of y'all are descended from my Igbo princess. If, you, if she was a princess, she would be back there in, sitting on her throne <laughs> and not picking cotton in Alabama. The second one is tied to it. Right? Some African Americans actually believe that <laughs> they were never slaves, that somehow they came here on the Mayflower or something. That never happened. We are all descended from slaves. The only question is, when? your ancestors became free. 10% of us, are, of our ancestors, of our people, were free by 1860, as you just saw from those st statistics. Here's something very curious. Where's Darlene? Oh, there you are, Darlene. Here's something very interesting. Yeah. We, of all the people I've done, three were descended from free Negroes. And what do those three have in common? Anybody can guess. I will give you 50 cents. No, they all have the same profession. No, academics, where do they teach? Peter Gomes, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, and I are the only ones of the 30 people we've done who are descended from any free Negroes on any of their branches, and we all profess at Harvard. That is amazing. It's not good or bad, it just so happens to be a, a fact. Darling, I'm about to wrap up. The final thing is, how many of you are descended from Native Americans? Come on, don't be shy, raise your hand. Well, if y'all could see, almost every black person in here just raised their hand. All right, newsflash, none of y'all are descended from Native Americans. My grandmother has high cheekbones and straight black hair. Man, I must have heard that a thousand times when I was growing up. You know why she does? She does because you're descended from white people. Only 5% of the African American people have a significant amount of Native American ancestry. 58% have an equal amount of white ancestry. 77, the average African American is 77% black, 17.5% white, and only 5% Native American. Don Cheadle is 19% white. Don Cheadle is 19% white, 18% white. Chris Tucker is 19% white. When I told Chris Tucker, he said, well, at least I ain't as black as Don Cheadle. That was. Uh, <laughs> I said, I'll be sure to tell him, Chris. <laughs> now, here's the other shocker. All the black men in this room, 35% of you don't descend from an African ethnic group at all. You descend from a white man. The reason that we have, we look like Native Americans is the blend between white and black. One in three black men in this room has, like I do, a white great, great, great grandfather. One in three and there's nothing that you can do about it. 1% <laughs> percent of the African American people have at least 50% European ancestry. That's the equivalent of one parent. Almost 20% of the African Americans have at least 25% European ancestry, and 58% of us have at least 12.5% European ancestry, and only 5% of us have any significant Native American ancestry at all. Here's my family tree. When I was Nine years old, this is only as far as I could get. I could get, that's me, up to my 
great grandmother there, and that top green box is Jane Gates. All these ancestors didn't exist five years ago for me. The Mormon genealogist found all these people, and everybody on here is black except one person. They have restored my ancestors back to the 18th century. My fourth grade, three sets of fourth grade grandparents, including a man up there, number 126, named John Redmond, who to my enormous amazement actually fought in the American Revolution. One of the 5,000 black men who fought in the American Revolution. Because of that, my brother and I were inducted into the Sons of the American Revolution. Now go figure on that. I'll, um, when we started a project at Harvard if I didn't know, I'm a reasonably well-educated person. I didn't know I descended from a black patriot. How many more of you are, must be descended from black patriots and don't know it? So we started a project when we are looking at the pension applications, and um, 80,000 pension applications, matching them against the census, which reveals race. And we're going to announce this. When my brother and I are inducted to the Sons of the American Revolution, the press covered it, because ain't nobody black in the <laughs> Sons of the American Revolution, right, or the DAR. So they covered it, and my brother and I walked in with his son, who was 12, and took my father. Walked in, ladies and gentlemen, it was the whitest audience I ever saw in my life. My father, uh, my brother looked at me and said, you sure we want to do this? <laughs> so I told them that we were going to do this project. We we're going to find black patriots. My brother patriots, you know, they got this language like a lodge, you know. My brother patriots is all being filmed. And I said, we're going to find so many black patriots. A year from now, this room's going to look just like Harlem. And, and nobody laughed. <laughs> Well, to conclude, to conclude, I found so many amazing things, so many amazing things, but I want to end by my favorite genealogical story, which is uh, the story of Constantine Winfrey. 1870, Constantine Winfrey is an illiterate slave in Atala County, Mississippi. 1876, he's living with his wife named Violet, living next door to a white man named Absalom Winfrey, which is where he got his name. He's um, Let's, I'm making this up, say he's 28, 10, we go back to the 1860 census, Absalom owns an 18-year-old black male slave, has got to be the same guy. 1876, the year of the hayes tilden Compromise, Constantine Winfrey, Winfrey walks up to a white man named John R. Watson, who had been a Confederate veteran, officer, owned acres and acres of bottom land in Atala County. And he said, boss, you see those 80 acres of land with the river running through it? gently rolling hills covered with timber. He said, I'll pick eight bales of cotton, clean, lit cotton, in two years. And if I do that, you'll give me those 80 acres of land. And John Watson must have thought, this is the dumbest Negro I ever saw. And he makes a deal with him. And he says, if you're one ounce short, I get all the cotton, you get none of the land. Now, if this was a Spike Lee movie, the last scene would be this brother, Constantine and Violet, pushing this big cart of cotton. By the way, eight bales of cotton weighs 3,200 pounds. You know what a little ball of cotton is. This is clean cotton after it's been cleaned. That's a lot of work. If this was a Spike Lee movie, this brother would be pushing that cotton up. John Watson would be there in his Confederate uniform. He said, boy, you did a good job. Well, you beat me. Here's your land. And Constantine and Violet would go, and they'd be all happy, and they'd be have their little tent that we're going to talk about, their big house they're going to build, going to have children, children going to go to Northwestern one day, things like that. <laughs> Then in the middle of the night, they'd go to sleep. you hear the horses. <laughs> and you'd know it was the Ku Klux Klan, and they would come and lynch Constantine, right? None of that happened. I had Oprah on camera, the land deed that the widow of John Watson and his son signed over to Constantine Winfrey. Not only has he picked 3,200 bales of pounds of cotton, eight bales of cotton, the brother has learned to read and write in 10 years. He signs his name. You want to know? Why well, Oprah Winfrey's Oprah Winfrey? Because she descends from Constantine Winfrey. The power of genealogy to change lives is something I've seen myself. That's why my colleagues and I at the Du Bois Institute right now are working on a curriculum. We want to revolutionize how we teach inner city black kids history and science. If Darlene and I walked into an inner city school and said today's lesson is DNA, Watson and Crick and the double helix, people would say get out of town. But if we say, you see this Q-tip? You're going to swab your cheek. In six weeks, we're going to tell you what tribe you're from. And while we wait for the results, we're going to teach you how DNA actually works. Then we're going to go down to the social studies teacher. And we're going to have a six-week unit when everybody has to do their family tree. They're going to go home, learn the skills of oral history, interview their mother, 
interview their father, interview their grandparents. Each week we'll have electronic um, family trees. Each week they're going to add another level. After 1930, you can access the federal census. We're going to take them to the library, or you can do it on the internet, take them to ancestry.com, trace them all the way back to 1870. Any black person get back to 1870. We all descend from a black person who shows up with a name for the first time in 1870 because we're freed, our ancestors were freed by 13th Amendment, 1865, right? And you appear in the census. And, and then we show them how to look at slave records in the slave county to try to find an ancestor like Absalom Winfrey who's 10 years younger. What child is not gonna be turned on by that? What's your favorite subject, ladies and gentlemen? Your favorite subject is yourself. <laughs> what child is not gonna be turned on by learning about themselves through this unit? That's what my hope is. My hope is that we can restore in so many of our children who have lost the way, the love of learning, the blackest thing that you could do when I was growing up. And we could use this new way of teaching science and teaching history, not to take our people back to the, back to the future, but to take our people black to the future. Thank you very much.